gentlemen, this is Kern Tip speaking to you from the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. The Southern Methodist Mustangs take on the Baylor Bears this afternoon, and 58 miles to Walker, made back. It looks like a pass, but wait, watch that Doka go, wide to his right, and swinging down five seconds to go, right from the 20. Last made back, he throws, work holds it in for a good gain, and first down the wing to the right, Barry stays on the ground, takes it right tackle, goes wide, cut, side step, cut, works out again, and comes on his right 30. First takes to Stan Williams on the 40. Williams breaks loose, heads across the field, moves to the front. Now, Roach waiting. He takes Bait back and fires a long one to all American Froggy Williams. He grabs it with a man on his back and trips over right guard. Gets away from a pair of ponies. Now watch him scamper to the 30, the 20, the 15, the 10, and he's... Everything that's truly fantastic about intercollegiate football. For awe-inspiring team and individual accomplishments. For the greatest games, the greatest upsets, and the greatest memories, you just can't top the electrifying Southwest Conference. Hi, I'm Connie Alexander, speaking to you for Exxon. During the next 30 minutes, we're going to flip through a portion of the Southwest Conference history book. We're going to try to squeeze a quarter century of gridiron heroics into a short half hour of entertainment. We can't cover all the great games, we can't cover every great team, and certainly not all the great players. But we will try to capture the styles of play, the moods, the trends, and the excitement that have made the game great for players and fans alike. We hope the end result is a faithful synopsis of a story that could fill a thousand books. Tackling SMU's great Doak Walker had to be one of football's most frustrating assignments. Running, passing, kicking, and catching, he became one of the nation's rare three-time consensus All-Americans and made his big 37 a number known throughout the football world. Doak Walker was typical of Southwest Conference players right after World War II. There weren't many specialists back then. Everybody just did everything he could, and old Doak did just about everything. While Doak Walker was a razzle-dazzler, Texas quarterback Bobby Lane was a tough, gutty, devil-may-care competitor. Number 22 would do just about anything legal to beat you, and he usually did. Doak and Bobby, close personal friends, former high school teammates. They met in 1947 in the college game that was the talk of the nation. Undefeated Texas in white, winner of six straight contests against undefeated SMU, winner of five, dueling for the conference crown. After hauling the opening kickoff back some 81 yards to the Longhorn 19, the great Paul Page moves for the opening touchdown a few plays later. In the second period, speedy Byron Guillory lugs a Mustang punt back 40 yards to the SMU 30. Then Lane coolly goes to the air and fires completions to Schwarzkopf and Bumgardner, setting Texas up deep in Mustang territory. From there, Tom Landry slips through tackle for the tying touchdown. Just before the half, Gil Johnson tosses downfield to the speeding Doak, who rambles all the way to the one-yard line. Then Dick McKissick cracks the middle for the touchdown. In the fourth stanza, Lane again leads his troops to what could be the tying score 
but the extra point is missed, and Doak and the Mustangs escape with a one-point victory, 14 to 13. The late 40s began an era of great competitors, typified by an intense love of the game and a dogged determination to play. Who could forget the masked marvel, A&M's number 36, Bob Smith wearing his famous Halloween mask when face protection was not yet stylish. But he did it only to protect an already broken nose. In 1950, he set the all-time Southwest Conference one-season rushing record. And what about the other no-nonsense bruisers? Watch number 30, Byron Townsend of Texas. You can see why he deserved both his tremendous reputation and a healthy respect from defenders throughout the conference. As in every era, the post-war Southwest Conference had its share of talented fancy dance to take the pressure off the big boys. Most notable was Arkansas's Clyde Smackover Scott, returning from the London Games as an Olympic silver medal and using his sprinter's speed to become a 1948 All-American. At SMU, number 44 took its place alongside 37, and the flashy Kyle Rope began a career that would bring Mustang fans their second consecutive triple threat back a career that would see Rote earn well-deserved All-American honors. In 1949, even the specialists began to find their niche in the conference family. At SMU, tall Fred Bennerts piled up an impressive set of new passing statistics. But the game still belonged to the great all-round athlete. And when it came to versatility, Froggy Williams, number 84, was a tough man to forget. He was one of the most superb ball players ever to don a Rice uniform. The 1949 Rice-Texas game is a great example of his ability. Early in the game, Ray Stone of Texas blocks a Gordon Wyatt punt. It rolls out of the end zone for a safety, and the Longhorns grab an early two to nothing lead. In the second quarter, Paul Campbell hands to Randy Clay, who rambles for a key first down deep in Owl territory. Then Clay finishes the job by scoring from the one, and Texas has a nine nothing margin. Near the half, Campbell again finds Clay with a bomb and the Longhorns are in business at the Rice Four, threatening to take the game out of reach. But the great Froggy Williams breaks through to swipe the next aerial and then runs it out of danger. In the third quarter, trailing now 15 to nothing, the Owls begin to gather momentum. Billy Burkhalter drives to the Texas One, setting up this Wyatt touchdown, and the Owls are down just 15 to seven. Quarterback Vernon Glass continues his hot hand with this clean scoring heave to wide open Bill Burkhalter. The Owls narrow the gap to a single point, but there's just 10 seconds left in the game. The Owls call on Froggy Williams, their great All-American, and he calmly boots an 18-yard pressure-packed field goal. Rice pulls it out 17 to 15. If the post-war era was one of excitement, the early 50s were nothing short of hysteria. Southwest Conference stadiums cried uncle under the weight of enthusiastic capacity crowds. The spreading mania drove the bowl builders back to their drawing boards. In 1951, it was TCU's famous Dutch Meyer spread that piqued the interest of the fan and produced the Cinderella Sop of the Year. Subbing for the injured superstar Gil Bartosh, untested tailback Ray McCown fired the Frogs to the conference title and earned the unforgettable title of the Ding Dong Dandy from Dumas.
After a brief period of two platoon football, the game was turned back to the 60-minute man and great all-round players like Rice's Dickie Magel. SMU furnished Frank Item, a durable ball carrier whose finesse and elusiveness made him doubly dangerous. In the Ozarks, Henry Moore was running with reckless abandon, and an occasional loss of a jersey wasn't near enough to slow him down. Along with teammate Preston Carpenter, he led the Razorbacks to the 1954 conference crown. The major excitement of the mid-50s was provided by Jimmy Swink and John David Crow. In 1956, it was TCU's Swink, a consensus All-American as a junior, against Crow, the rugged Aggie destined to win the coveted Heisman Trophy. Jimmy Swink, the high-stepping sprinter, the swivel-hipped epitome of grace and elusiveness, against John David Crow, Texas A&M's fearless young hammer, a ball carrier with bone-breaking power and determination with a habit of running at and over all who challenged him. In 1956, they met in a near hurricane in one of the most highly touted battles of the era. After the Horned Frogs recover an Aggie fumble, Swink rambles for 11 yards through the rain and mud for a TCU first down. That sets up this spectacular touchdown pass from Chuck Curtis to O.D. Williams, who makes a grandstand grab at the end line. The Frogs miss the point and lead 6 to nothing. Late in the fourth quarter now, A&M with first down on their own 20, 80 yards from pay dirt. John David sets the drive in motion with the slashing 21-yard ramble for a first down. Then Don Watson gobbles up 37 big yards around the left side, putting the Aggies on the TCU 19. The great John David dashes for 11 more yards to the four, then turns receiver and hauls in this touchdown toss from Roddy Osbert. A&M's kick is good, and the Ags take the game 7-6 to six and go on to an unbeaten season, collecting all the conference marbles. As the 50s were about to become history, it looked as if the Southwest Conference had reached a peak. Who could possibly come along to equal the Crows and the Swings? Who could match Rice's Cossie Johnson or Buddy Dial? Who could create more excitement than Jim Moody of Arkansas or Larry Isbell of Baylor? Who else but Don Meredith? Quarterback Meredith, the guy who gave conference defensive backs the cold sweat. Jimmy Saxton of Texas and Jack Spikes of TCU were exciting runners, but SMU's Don Meredith quickly became one of the most feared and respected quarterbacks in league history. For one thing, he had the spread formation going for it, and it was hard for any team to prepare for it in just a single week. In addition, he was hitting somewhere near 70% of his passes, and he wasn't afraid to throw from anywhere in the ballpark. While he lulled everyone to sleep, joking about his slow, thin legs, Don Meredith sent conference statisticians back to their volumes. In the age of the big back and the fluid drive runner, Meredith made a lasting imprint on Southwest Conference history. The 60s began with a new member joining the Southwest Conference family. The Texas Tech Red Raiders ended their long wait on the conference doorstep and officially joined the league wars. Led by defensive demon E.J. Holub, their consensus All-American, the newcomers from West Texas served immediate notice that they had come to play and were here to stay. Holub was by no means the only excellent defender of the period. 
All around the league, the conference was taking an unusual interest in defense. Baseball scores like 3 to 2, 7 to 6, and 6 to nothing were deciding many key games. Guys like Tommy Nobus and Pat Culpepper at Texas, Bob Lilly at TCU, and Wayne Harris at Arkansas were getting as much ink as the dashing dandies. It just goes to show that in any era of Southwest Conference football, there will be something of interest for every type of football fan. In Waco, football fans were lamenting the career of quarterback Doyle Trailer. One of the most highly touted, heavily recruited superstars ever to leave the Texas high school gridirons, Doyle Trailer was the boy who was going to take the Bruins to the title. But it seemed like every time Doyle took the field, he'd break another bone, and Baylor fans were wondering how he kept coming back. At the dawn of the early 60s, the sun appeared to be shining for the fighting guys from Waco, and the talent-laden Bears were gearing up for a run at the conference throne. Led by a trio of Ronnies, Ronnie Bull and Ronnie Goodwin at the halves, and deadly Ronnie Stanley in the driver's seat, the Bears made a strong bid in 1960, but finished second to Arkansas, even though they had beaten the Razorbacks by two touchdowns in the conference opener. Again in 1963, the Scrappy Bears were unbeaten in their first six conference games. This time it was the sizzling passing of Don Trull and the receiving wizardry of Lawrence Elkins that fueled the Bears to a season-ending showdown against the powerful Texas Longhorns, also unbeaten and untied. The All-American duo gets hot in a hurry, as evidenced by these truel passes to Elkins for nine, then 37 yards, and finally for five more yards. But the drive stalls when Truel throws incomplete into the end zone on fourth down. Texas, finding the Bears a stern test, takes to the air on this pitch from Duke Carlisle to Joe Dixon. Carlisle then takes matters into his own hands and runs to the Baylor 19. Later, he drives to the Bear 4. He then turns the scoring chores over to dependable Tommy Ford, who notches the only Texas score, and the Longhorns lead 7 to nothing. As time runs out, Baylor needs 87 yards to tie the game, and Truel goes right to work. He fires to Elkins for a key first down, then catches the Texas middle napping and drops a lob pass to Ken Hodge. Now with 20 yards and 29 seconds to go, Truel makes a desperate attempt to cap the drive. But it's the great Duke Carlisle who steps into the pattern and wraps up the conference title for Texas. Meanwhile, in Lubbock, a blonde phenomenon named Donnie Anderson was beginning to build the reputation and the records that would later make him a two-time All-American. A six-foot, three-inch powerhouse, additionally blessed with speed and finesse, the Golden Palomino, as he was being called, was doing everything that could be done on a football field, and doing it well. If the defenses bottled up Donnie as a runner, he'd run wild as a receiver.
By the mid and late 60s, the pendulum had come full swing, and the wild offensive show was once again the recognizable Southwest Conference trademark. Those responsible were passers like Chuck Hickson, who shattered conference passing standards and guided an aerial-minded attack that was accurately titled Excitement. As an SMU sophomore, Hickson became the national passing champion and at the same time established several conference passing records. The amazing Ed Hargett, who also wore number 10, delivered a steady rain of bombs for the usually ground-conscious Aggies. The emergence of the Hargett-led Aggie aerial attack spurred A&M to the 1967 Southwest Conference title and brought Ed Hargett all-conference honors in 67 and 68. At Texas, halfback Chris Gilbert was setting new marks for Southwest Conference rushing while earning All-American honors. He set an all-time career rushing record and became the only player to rush for over a thousand yards a year for three straight years. At the same time, SMU's Jerry Levias flashed around the gridiron putting his name in the record book. A three-way star, Levias enhanced the Mustangs' image as a great offensive show. He made all-conference three times and consensus All-American in his senior year. With the widening of the goalposts, the field goal came into prominence. Each year, the kickers got more accurate. Each year, the field goal decided more key conference contests until it happened. In 1970, Bill McClard, the deadly Razorback booter, unleashed an unbelievable 60-yard attempt. More unbelievably, it bounced on and over the crossbar, setting an all-time NCAA record. The most revolutionary offensive weapon of the late 60s had to be the University of Texas wishbone teeth. This crunching, slug it out new formation quickly gained national prominence. Led by quarterbacks like James Street and Eddie Phillips, making the most of big, fast, versatile backs like Steve Wooster, a two-time All-American, and Jim Bertelson, Texas rode the wishbone to two straight undefeated seasons, which included one of the most famous games in football history. 1969, college football centennial year, the last day of the season, Texas versus Arkansas. Both teams undefeated, untied, rated number one and number two nationally, with the victor to become the undisputed national champion. A minute and a half after the opening kickoff, Bill Burnett puts the Razorbacks on top seven to nothing. In the third quarter, Arkansas strikes again as Bill Montgomery fires to All-American receiver Chuck Dykas to make it 14 to nothing. As the fourth quarter opens, James Street, behind the blocking of Bobby Wunsch and Bob McKay, outstreaks the Razorback defenders to make it 14 to 6.
Street gambles for two points on a counter option, and he gets it. Now it's 14 to 8. After this crucial interception by Danny Lester, Texas begins a last-ditch drive. Facing a critical fourth down and three, Street shuns all caution and goes for the bomb. Randy Peschel gathers it in at the Arkansas 13. Two plays later, Jim Bertelson bashes over to tie the score. Happy Feller adds the point after, and Texas takes the game and the national championship 15 to 14. September 1971, and Southwest Conference history was made as crosstown rivals Rice and Houston clashed for the first time. Runners Staley Vincent of Rice and Robert Newhouse of Houston were the standouts as Houston played its initial game as a conference member, even though the Cougars can't compete for the conference gridiron title until the 1976 season. Vincent became the leading rusher in Rice history. While Newhouse paced Houston to a 9-2 season and became the nation's second leading rusher. So, as you have seen, styles change, people change, formations change, but the game remains the same. It's still a contest of courage fought on an intensely public battlefield, and as in the game of life, to the winners go the laurels. We can't know, of course, what tomorrow will bring. But if it's anything like yesterday, the Southwest Conference will continue to be the most exciting place in the world to see every form of football entertainment. As my colleague Kern Tips used to say during his more than 30 years as the voice of Southwest Conference football, go to all the games you can, because nothing can compare to the suspense, the thrills, the heartbreak, and the heroics of the saga that is Southwest Conference football. <laughs>